Okay, so let me just show you briefly something I noticed uh, that we can add to the simple nested sampling function here. Uh, and that is a visualization. Um, we could say for every, every 40th iteration here in our loop, we make a plot. And what do we plot? We plot, for example, the life points. You could plot also, I don't know, something about the likelihoods, something like that. But here I would just plot the life points where they are distributed. And um, I will highlight the one with the lowest uh, likelihood, the one that is about to be replaced. And if I add that and run it, And if my computer is nice to me, then it will produce a bunch of plots. So here is the iteration zero. So in the beginning, we already know this plot from above. This point is being replaced. Then here is something interesting already. In iteration 40, we have no points in these corners. And as you go further and further, you see it's exploring this banana. And this is where these life points live. This one is being replaced here. This one is being replaced. And finally, we have a very thin region in this parameter space um, where our points are distributed. I thought there was just some neat thing that you could add some visualizations to see what your procedure is doing. I will just bring up the code again. And here's just every 40 iterations, make a scatter point plot of the life points. Okay. Um, uh, maybe, you, maybe you could add a, um, a fixed range for the axis so that one could compare better the, the plots. Yes. Just an idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good idea. Because you see it's zooming in to very narrow ranges. Mm -hmm. I will leave that to you to try. Okay, so um, for this session, what I thought I would uh, do is since this is an sort of advanced course or uh, it, it is aiming to provide practical tools for inference, I will talk uh, so, so far we've talked about basic algorithms some toy implementations. Um, and now I would like to talk about um, really robust implementations or ideas for ro robust implementations um, that you then can really use for your problems. And we already had one of these examples and that is Stan that you will use uh, very heavily next week. <clears throat> so that's the advanced version of the toy MCMC that we created. And uh, for these advanced versions, I will start with talking about uh, nested sampling, because that's what we just uh, heard about. So that's sort of fresh. And uh, you already learned something interesting in the tutorial, um, which is that this algorithm when it's replacing points, when you do the MCMC uh, to find a new point, it just does a geometric exploration. You just wander around in this space and you don't care about the likelihood value. You only care if you're above that likelihood threshold at that point. <clears throat> so you're making this kind of geometric exploration and you separate it out how steep this likelihood function is. So nested sampling has this kind of divide and conquer approach where you separate the volume aspect from the likelihood aspect. And it also has a divide and conquer uh, aspect in that at each iteration, it's solving a problem and taking a bit of the problem away. So it's cutting out this sort of shell in volume and then it deals with the subproblem uh, that remains, and again and again and again. And uh, this sort of uh, this sort of scheme 
um, has some benefits and some drawbacks. And one of the benefits, or what, let me just uh, try to make some doodles here. So we, if you remember, the plot that Francesca showed, where here you have on one axis your parameter versus uh, the mode of your parameter. So here um, on the left would be the peak of your likelihood function. Uh, but the volume increases, so that would be your likelihood. But uh, your volume is increasing towards the outside. <clears throat> and what nested sampling does is it starts all the way out here with the entire volume and it slowly climbs up um, this likelihood and explores the space this way. And then at some point it stops because here the volume is small. It goes to zero as you go closer and closer to the, to the mode. So you see the, the drawback here is <clears throat> that you have to first cross all of the space that is completely irrelevant because the, the likelihood is essentially zero there. <clears throat> but at the same time, you have the benefit that if you have your parameter space here and you have two peaks in this space, uh, in nested sampling, you you have this initialization procedure where initially you draw points everywhere. <clears throat> and so it's kind of a global algorithm. It explores the entire parameter space first and zooms in to the interesting regions. <clears throat> and um, so it is an algorithm that looks at the entire parameter space in some sense, of course, with some finite resolution set by the number of life points but it has a good chance of finding both of these peaks. And so one of the benefits is this global um, exploration. <clears throat> and one of the drawbacks is this finding the posterior bulk, which might need quite a lot of iterations. Why do we need to do this phase here, this uh, initial phase? Because we want to do the integral. We want to do uh, our integral over the parameter space, Z. Let me draw this again, Z. Is the integral of our yeah, well, this is one way to write it. And uh, this integral depends on how large that space is, how large this important, uh, this important region is, this typical set is relative to the prior. In MCMC, we don't care about that. We just go to where most of the posterior is. We can, our chain, can skip ahead or we can even start it there somewhere near the interesting region. And we can just let it run around there. But because we are interested also in this integral, we need to know how, how large this region of the parameter space is relative to other regions. Okay, So how large this is relative to the entire space. And in high dimensional spaces, you it's very difficult to measure, but because of the nested sampling iterations, it sort of keeps track of this. <clears throat> 
Okay, let me. If you have any questions, please just uh, unmute yourself and uh, or raise a hand. And um, and and uh, yeah, just ask a question or put it in a chat, whichever is easiest for you. So let me just stop this. <clears throat> okay, what I would like to now talk about is. Their question? Yeah, I would have one, potentially mm -hmm. a, a rather stupid one, but uh, the uh, the the evidence that you just gave in your doodling mm -hmm. uh, was just the integration over the uh, the prior um, or no the per, the parameter space, if you will. Uh, but and, and this is me being very confused with some of the terms in Bayesian statistics, but uh, uh, my um, knowledge of, of the evidence is that it's the integration of our likelihood times the distribution of our priors, uh, of our parameters. Yes. So I'm a bit confused here. Yeah. Um, I also don't like this pi. I usually use it differently. So let me just uh, delete some of this. Okay. So what I would usually write is the integral of over your parameter space. And then you have the prior times your likelihood. Right? Oh, OK. I, I prefer the notation that this, this is prior, I call pi the prior, but uh, yesterday Francesco was showing pi as the posterior, that's your target function, the target distribution, which is the product of prior and posterior, right? Okay. So yeah. it's different notations. Yeah, uh, notations, conventions are a mess, Statistic, statisticians yeah. should really uh, try to make this a bit more uniform, I feel yes. like. Okay, thank you yeah. for clarifying. It's, it's kind of interesting. So MCMC operates sort of on this object, on the posterior. And um, well, it's not entirely a clear and fair statement, but for nested sampling, um, this volume is a separate, very specific object and the likelihood is the other object it's 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 operating on. Are there more questions? Okay. Then <clears throat> so we already saw two schemes for finding a new point for this likelihood restricted prior sampling. And um, this aspect of nested sampling is similar to the transition kernels that we've learned about in MCMC. So um, MCMC is a framework of algorithms and you put in a transition kernel, it could be for example, our Gaussian random walk or the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, and you get one particular instance of a uh, class of MCMC algorithms, and they all have names. And the situation is similar for nested sampling. We were looking at this um, rejection sampling algorithm um, from the entire prior. That would be one class of nested sampling algorithms that would be terrible. And then we were looking at using MCMC inside of nested sampling to solve this same problem. And so that's another sort of special instance of nested sampling. And again, all of them have names. And I want to introduce you to some of the ideas that people have come up with for making this process uh, efficient. And for that, I will share the screen again. And 
basically take you through a short um, tour of some of the papers. And one of the early papers that, um, that was uh, tackling this issue is this one. And they were concerned about uh, model uh, comparison in cosmology. And uh, so they implemented nested sampling and uh, they explained nested sampling and how it works, so forth. And here's their explanation. Okay, you have these contours and they correspond to walking up this likelihood versus volume plot. And <clears throat> here is um, somewhere here in details is what they introduce. The most challenging task is implementing how to sample uniformly from the remaining prior value without making a lot of overhead. Um, and the key observation here is that we can use the existing points as a guide to where we should draw our new points. So what they do is they compute the covariance of the light points. So that's um, sort of their orientation. If you've ever done principal component analysis or something like that, it's sort of the, the orientation of these points. And then they, they find this coordinate system. And you can also use this covariance or this coordinate system to define an ellipsoid. Um, so you have an ellipsoid in this coordinate system let me just show a nice illustration from this paper. They don't, uh, this paper uh, doesn't produce any new methods, but they do a very good job of describing various aspects and methods and have uh, a bunch of nice visualizations in here. So let me just scroll to the important one here. Mm. I thought there was a better one. Okay, let me pick up the one from this paper. Oh, here. Yeah. Okay, so. Um, the, the green here would be the ellipsoid um, that is oriented with the covariance of these uh, white points. In this case, this green one is not exactly touching um, these points, but is already a bit enlarged. But that's the idea. You, you define this ellipsoid around the live points that you already have lying around. And what do they do then? So they create this ellipsoid that touches the maximum coordinate of the existing points. And then they realize, well, so the real contours of your likelihood, you don't know these. They might not be exactly elliptical. So you have to expand by some enlargement factor. And um, they, they try out a little bit how large this has to be. And I think they have a plot somewhere. Here, they try a bunch of enlargement factors and they find that if you enlarge by a factor of 1.5, then um, the integral seems to uh, be stable. And so this is uh, sort of a practical solution. If you just use this ellipsoid to sample a new point from that region, then um, you, you can save all of this space and you sort of concentrate just to the neighborhood. And then, um, so this is, this is this rejection sampling. And here you would have a single ellipsoid around your existing points. And this gray region would be where you would try to draw new points. Of course, that's not very ideal. Um, for this particular problem where the likelihood contours are very complicated. So in this case, you have these two um, 
rings and you're wasting a lot of space here where your proposal will not be successful. So then came the multi-nest paper. And what they do is they apply a clustering algorithm uh, to these live points. And um, it's a recursive algorithm. It's, I don't know if you're familiar with k-means, but it's quite similar. It's called x-means. But the point is they cluster into ellipsoids and now they have a description with many ellipsoids of these live points that are already lying around. And again, they enlarge by some fudge factor and obtain uh, this region where they can draw proposals. And this is a very efficient algorithm and solves uh, many practical problems very well. And uh, then this one is the one I already showed you in the simulation, in the um, animation, which is that you make an ellipsoid around each of the live points and you find out how large you have to make those to, um, with leaving out some points randomly and making sure you always recover them. This algorithm is a bit slower. This is called red friends if you use um, spheres, hyperspheres. And if you use a covariance matrix of the, of the existing points, that is called ML friends. And this algorithm is implemented also in the package Ultranest. <clears throat> and if this is the, the sort of the documentation page for this one, it's a open source package which implements the algorithm that I just described. And you can use it from a bunch of programming languages. And it implements nice things like parallelization and so forth. And you can find out how to use it, tutorials and so forth. Okay. So these, all of these ideas that I just, just talked about use this concept of neighborhood from the existing live points. And it's sort of geometrically intuitive of what these are, uh, how to go about this. But there is a problem if you go to uh, high dimensional spaces. So if you apply these ideas to 10, 20, 50 dimensional problems, this becomes very quickly inefficient. And the reason is that, so if you imagine, an ellipsoid here, this one. Um, if you're, so it covers some part of your space of interest. It covers some space of interest and then some region away um, from, from where you're supposed to sample. But recall that the volume grows exponentially as you move away in likelihood from your peak. So you're including, if you go to high dimension, this tail of your ellipsoid is actually extremely huge. In other words, you're wasting a lot of space by being slightly off here. And uh, so for high dimensional problems, the, all of these ideas uh, cannot work because this concept of neighborhood, this sort of metric of what is near and what is far is breaking down. So when you have these high dimensional problems, what you have to do is to use uh, a different method, which is to use something like MCMC inside nested sampling. And you've already seen one example of that. And there are a bunch of ideas that I want to introduce now, how to do this uh, MCMC approach. And I think they are shown here. So we talked about this uh, creating a bound and doing rejection sampling. That's not what we'll talk about now. We will talk about uh, something else. So for example, we did this random walk. You have a Gaussian proposal and you diffuse around in your space. Okay, and then there are different ideas of how you do this sampling. 
for example, you could pick an axis. You start from this point, you pick uh, your, one of your parameters and uh, you make a slice through your parameter space and you try to find a new point on the slice that fulfills your requirement of being above that likelihood threshold. Then you repeat that with a different axis and so forth. Finally, you end up at a different place. This is called slice sampler. And if you randomize the orientation, you don't just go by the axes of your parameter space. This would be a hit and run uh, Monte Carlo. So these are also MCMC random walks. And then finally, you can also do Hamiltonian random walks within this. But remember, we are doing a geomet geometric exploration. So we don't care about the value of the likelihood. It only has to be above our likelihood threshold. So what ends up happening is we don't have any acceleration going on here um, because our target function is the prior and let's assume the prior is flat we always go uh, straight we don't feel any acceleration except at the points where we reflect and there have been two papers at least that uh, looked at this and i want to bring them up very briefly so this is one by michael bettencourt on using constrained hamiltonian monte carlo and uh, this one is another one by John Skilling, and he talks about Galilean Monte Carlo, which is sort of an extension to this idea. And I just want to explain both of them with this sort of sketch. So let's say you have the starting point and you pick a random direction and you pick some step size. How do you choose them to be debated? Um, you make a step, you look whether that point is inside, and you make another step. And as long as you're inside, you continue like this. But it could also happen that you are stepping outside of your bound. What do you do then? Well, you have um, this border here. So you, you know you sort of cross this border, but you don't know what's the shape of this likelihood contour at this point. But you, from this point, you can compute a gradient and then you know the normal um, of this contour. So you know, and that is illustrated here by the black, thick black line. So you know how you would have to reflect if this was your border. So you could go here, you do a reflection, so you apply the normal, and your vector changes and you take the next step and you hope that your next step is inside. And if that's the case, then you've reflected and you continue your exploration. But it can also happen that that point is not inside. What do you do then? In Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, you would stop them. You cannot proceed anymore. And what this paper suggests is Instead, you walk backwards, you continue your walk backwards. And they show that this is um, okay with the uh, requirements of Markov chain Monte Carlo. They show that it preserves the detailed balance. Let me just bring up another sketch here from this paper. It's also nice. So, in this case, they don't assume that the prior is flat. So, you might find some acceleration from the prior. So your prior exploration follows this and suddenly you're stepping outside your constraint. And now you compute the, the gradient there. The gradient is pointing you back inside and you use that to reflect and continue your process. And from here, you would again walk according to your prior. So these are various schemes of implementing this likelihood restricted prior sampling. And you will want to use something like this, or if you can compute gradients maybe, or one of the other ideas. Um, let me just see if I can bring that to plot. 
this one. So if you have gradients, maybe you want to do this. If you don't have gradients and you're in high dimension, probably you want to do one of these and CMC based one. And if you're in relatively low dimensions, you can use some bounds and take advantage of the geometry. Now I will pause a bit for questions. Are there any questions? No questions. Okay. Well, if you think of some, please feel free to interrupt. Okay, so for the other algorithms, um, we also talked about the variance of the evidence. So for example, for um, important sampling, we talked about how uncertain your estimate is of the evidence. And there is an estimator for that for nested sampling as well, but I didn't present it because it's a bit more involved and not as quite as intuitive. With nested sampling, you can also compute um, how what's your information gain going from the prior to the posterior. The information gain is directly related to how many iterations you had to do until you hit um, the bulk of your posterior. So now I want to talk about some diagnostics. We, we had some diagnostics a little bit on the, on the important sampling, for example, the number of effective samples that can tell you whether your proposal is efficient or not. And we learned quite a few diagnostics for Markov chain Monte Carlo. But for nested sampling, we haven't really talked about how do you know whether this algorithm is doing okay or it's running into some issues. And for that, I want to show, let me just close a bunch of things here. So, uh, and these papers are also linked in the books and papers thing. So these two papers, uh, I will start with this one. Uh, no, I will start with this one. So this is a paper really just about these diagnostic checks or diagnostic tests, and they introduce a whole bunch of them. <clears throat> and um, let me just scroll through here. So if you have a biased likelihood restricted prior, prior sampling procedure, then you might have a problem because for example, if your MCMC is not moving anywhere, uh, it's sort of, sticking around where it started, then you will not sample unbiased in an unbiased fashion your likelihoods. And so your posterior will be slightly off. You can sort of notice that sometimes if you run a nested sampling a couple of times and you see that the posteriors are different depending on the run. So what they suggest is if you run several times and you notice substantial differences in the posteriors, then that might be an indication that something is off. And so here they show, oh, and um, additionally to that, um, you can also compute an uncertainty on for each run on the posterior distribution. How do you get that? Well, so we know that the volumes are distributed according to beta distribution, so there's already some uncertainty there. And if you incorporate that, you can produce a bunch of uh, posterior distributions 
for a single run. You can do this for run one and run two. And that's what they show here. And what you see is that even within, so in red here, it shows the posterior for run one, I guess. Uh, uh, Johannes, is it just me or are you not sharing the screen? Oh, I'm very sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, so I wanted to talk about this paper, nest check, which is about diagnostic tests for nested sample. And it's all in this notebook, books and papers. These two is what I'm talking about now. So what they do here is <clears throat> they notice if you run nested sampling, uh, several times, you might see some differences in the posteriors. And how significant is that difference? So as I said, because the volumes are a bit uncertain, you can produce actually several posteriors for each run. So let's look at this first parameter here, for example. In one run, they get a posterior here, the red one, and they can quantify how uncertain it is given the limited number of life points. And in the second run, they do the same, they get this blue curve. And you see those uncertainties are not overlapping. So the difference is quite significant. You can also compute the means of these posteriors and look if they are quite different. And here is the blue and the, the red dashed line. And so that, that's one visual diagnostic to see whether there might be a problem with your procedure. Here are a bunch more diagnostic. This is the same plot, but just rotated. I will not present all of them, but one more I want to highlight, one diagnostic, <clears throat> which is um, that you also estimate the evidence, right? And if you run nested sampling a couple of times, you can also compute additional to the evidence and uncertainty on the evidence. I didn't show how to do that. But you can notice the scatter between individual runs, how much your evidence estimate scatters compared to this expected uncertainty. And that's what they, they plot here. If the, uh, basically it's the observed, um, to the real, um, sorry, it's the, they do some weird ratios here where they subtract what they expect, but basically it's um, the observed scatter in the evidence compared to the expected scatter from, uh, from the uncertainties. And so if everything was okay, then they would get this uh, dashed line, but they see that um, they get a different value. So more simply speaking, if you run nest sampling a couple of times and you see that your log C values um, are substantially different in each run, much larger than the error bars associated with them, that's a very good sign that something is off. And they discuss some more uh, quantitative checks, putting p-values on the significance of these things and so forth. <clears throat> but uh, let me tell you about some another test. And this one is, is, is really cool. I really like this one. And, um, and it's, it feels very similar to how native uh, these divergence tests feel an agency. This one feels very native for nested sampling, I would say. Unfortunately, it doesn't really have a good uh, visualization of what's going on. So let me just try to doodle on top of this. So, so when we did nested sampling, we always found the point that had the lowest likelihood. And so you already have this set of points and their likelihoods, and you can imagine keeping them sorted. So let's say we have, oh, that's a bit large. 
<clears throat> Let's say you have your array of your life points. And you keep them sorted. So here is the lowest one that you're going to replace. So this one's going to die. And you are sampling a new point. This is zero, this is n. And you're sampling a new point. And this new point also has a likelihood. And now we ask the question well, if you keep this sorted uh, array of life points, where would you? insert um, this new life point? Would it land here or would it land here and so forth? And so you can keep track of this index of this uh, order, this order in this iteration. And what we expect is that um, because we are sampling according to the likelihood distribution within that volume, that we might sometimes end, end up at these very low points, uh, low orders, and sometimes we end up here and sometimes in the middle. So we expect that it would be uniformly distributed. And that's what this paper is testing. Is that insertion order uniformly distributed? And you could imagine, for example, if you started your MCMC chain, let's say you start your MCMC chain from the lowest point and you're walking around in your banana and for some reason, uh, you are replacing this point, but your MCMC is not being very efficient. It's dragging its heels. It's not going anywhere. We're just staying very close to where it started, okay? And so you haven't moved very far in likelihood, perhaps. And that means you will be inserting, you will be inserting this blue point somewhere towards the lower orders. And so if you make a distribution of these orders, it would be biased to low orders. And you can test for this. Um, and, and see if it deviates from this uniform distribution. <clears throat> and then you recognize that there might be an issue. And uh, when, how do you do these tests? Well, let's have a look inside the paper. Um, this will now be on top of these uh, sketches, but anyways, and they, so what they do is they artificially pick uh, methods that they make a little bit worse, or they choose an MCMC that doesn't work very well, and they, they sort of use this ellipsoidal sampling, but to make the enlargement not big enough. And then they try this method and detect it in various dimensions and see how well they can detect it. And what they do is, um, they have this rolling p-value, so they do this test uh, every, let's say, a few hundred iterations. You, you check if your distribution is okay, and they also test it once at the very end. So that's that's the idea of these um, this diagnostic. I think it's very good. I think it's very cool, a cool idea. In fact, it's such a cool idea that I I did. Uh, suggest something similar afterwards, after I read this and was very excited about it. I basically replaced, so here I was, uh, they used this KS test to, to test for deviation from uniformity. But you can also use a test that knows that these values are integers. So the KS test in its standard form is just for continuous variables, although there are some extension. But you can use this Wilcoxon uh, U-test, and that is meant for integers. And then it's slightly uh, more sensitive. But the difference is very minor. <clears throat> 
doesn't make a big difference. So I will stop here again if you have any questions about diagnostics on nested sample. No questions. Everyone asleep or equally confused? Or it's all clear so far? Okay. So then so here are my notes, what I wanted to talk about. Um, then we can talk about a bit more practical aspects. And maybe I can bring up the slide I showed yesterday. Which is this one. So Um, if you have a practical implementation, you want to care about uh, numerics. So for example, that the likelihoods um, don't overflow and that you really compute uh, what you think you are computing when you implement it on a computer. You want to implement some of the diagnostics that I just mentioned. But another big question is, how do you parallelize these algorithms um, because I mean, modern day, day machines don't just have one CPU, they have several. The laptop I'm working here with here has 12. And you might want to farm out your problem to a computing cluster where you don't have tens of thousands of CPUs available to you. And how can we use these algorithms to really take advantage of this parallelization? And uh, for nested sampling, there have been several ideas suggested. So let me just jump to that. So parallelization. So first of all, you can of course do parallelization within your likelihood function because it can be arbitrary code in there. That's sort of the boring part. Um, when we do rejection sampling, and that rejection sampling is very inefficient, and we've seen this before, we did a thousand points where we try to see if we can find one that is, is, uh, that is above our likelihood threshold, we can farm out this procedure to many CPUs. So this is parallelization when the efficiency is low, low and this is what the multi-nest code does. It, it just gives each of the cores the task to sample from these ellipsoids. And the first successful draw then is returned to the main process and nested sampling continues. What you can also do is you add and remove several live points at once. And then you, have, you can farm this out and uh, proceed that way. Uh, we already mentioned uh, in the morning session that you can have multiple independent runs and later merge them. So then you have obvious parallelization right there. And so these are the main uh, ways you can parallelize nested sampling. I think the most common one is this one, where you just have a couple of um, processes that just try to find a new life point independently. And uh, 
let's think for a moment back to important sampling. How do we do parallelization there? So for important sampling, all of the points were independent. So you can just trivially farm it out to a computing farm. They don't have the, the individual processors don't have to know anything about each other. Uh, and they could just return the samples and you collect them, then you're done. So you don't have any communication problems there. For Markov chain Monte Carlo, recall that each point depends on the previous point. So for computing the next point, you already need to know the results from the previous point. And that makes it very difficult to parallelize this process. Uh, one way to parallelize it is to run multiple chains. And that's, I think, the, the standard approach. You have independent chains, and afterwards you look at how these performed. And you can combine the posterior samples from the uh, trivially again. So this is something I wanted to mention about when you go from toy problems to real um, software implementations and you really care about uh, taking advantage of the computing facilities that you have available to you. And now I want to talk about some differences between those three algorithms in terms of initialization, running, and termination. So for Markov chain Monte Carlo, we mostly talked about how do we update from one point to the next point. So we were running and improving and so forth. We had a bit of talk about initialization. Um, so where you start your chain, hopefully it doesn't really matter. But now let's think about uh, nested sampling um, in, this, in this part. So the initialization is very natural in nested sampling. You sample from the prior and you basically look at the entire, uh, in all regions of the parameter space. So you don't have this separate uh, starting point. You, 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 you just use the prior to, uh, to start your population of life, life points. And then you run. Um, and finally, there is a termination criterion. And so for Markov chain Monte Carlo, this was sort of a bit uh, handpicked because we just said we have some number of iterations and then we check whether um, our chain is good, whether it's converged, whether this is sufficient. And if not, I guess you change something about the algorithm or you run longer, maybe you double this length. Um, but here for nested sampling, you don't have to use the number of iterations. In fact, it was the exercise uh, one. You can terminate at a very natural point, which is when the volume becomes uh, basically zero, then you've explored this parameter space um, sufficiently well. So at that point, um, the region where you have very high likelihood values is tiny and you can stop. So it has this very ni nice natural termination point in nested sampling. But of course, people have come up with a ver variety of termination criteria. <clears throat> Any questions? Just uh, raise your hand or unmute yourself. Francesca. Hi, yeah, just thinking about termination criteria. Uh, so in principle with Markov Chick Carlo, it's there exists this guarantee that asymptotically samples from the chain, if the chain is valid, will approximate the expectation values that you're interested in, or can be used to approximate those values. And in the limit of n tending to infinity, this um, connection is exact. So then, of course, the problem is, when do you stop? What's enough n? And this we've talked about. Uh, but I'm curious with nested sampling, if there's some kind of similar asymptotic guarantee 
or if it's a kind of different motivation? Yes, uh, there is. Uh, let me just bring that up because I think that was also asked before uh, in a slightly different way. So I think I will just uh, bring up that paper if I can find it. <clears throat> and I would refer you to this paper. That works. This one. So they study some properties of nested sampling and um, let's see where they do this. I'm not sure if I can find the exact point now. I think I went over it. I think it's this one. <clears throat> so what they're saying here is on the left, you have this theoretical concept that you were talking about, that you have some, some function, some estimator. And um, on the right, you have basically what nested sampling is actually doing. It's weighing with this, uh, the volume and the, and the likelihood. Um, so that would be your posterior weight, some function at that point. And what they are proving in this paper is, I mean, that paper does other things as well, but what they're proving is that this, this estimator uh, is equal to what nested sampling actually does. Does this address your question? Yeah, pretty much. I guess I'm just wondering under what conditions is this holding, but I can look mm -hmm. myself. Think, so. <laughs> yeah, it's also not my strong suit to think about these um, uh, yeah, very theoretical concepts of what spaces and central limits and, and so forth. But the proofs do exist. And, I haven't seen any paper that claims that these uh, proofs have some issue or something like that. There is also uh, this other paper that you might find interesting if you're interested in these um, foundations. And that is, let's see if that comes up. Uh, yeah, this one. So where they <clears throat> try to rephrase nested sampling in another framework that has been studied for more, for many more years, which is sequential or population Monte Carlo. And the nested sampling isn't exactly a subset of this, um, but you can use some of the theorems that have been developed from that framework and then make some proofs that, for example, the evidence converges to the true value. And yeah, so if you're interested, this is another paper written by statisticians and they show how you can make a nested sampling procedure 
that is unbiased. So the evidence estimate or the posterior estimates um, are not off in the limit and they are consistent. So this is another important theory paper if you want to have a look at, at these properties. There more questions. Okay, so let me um, say, I think I brought this up before, but now you've seen a bunch of algorithms and of course you want to know which one should I pick and I will tell you there isn't one perfect algorithm. Um, and the algorithm you want to pick depends also what you want to do. So if you have a high dimensional problem, so for example, hundreds or thousands of dimensions, then you probably want to, and you don't want to compute the evidence, then you definitely want to do Hamiltonian Mar Markov chain Monte Carlo. If you want to compute the evidence, I'm actually not sure yet what you would do if you go to really thousands of dimensions. It's really, really hard. Um, we already talked about these peculiar shapes and what happens if you have multiple modes. Another complication you could have is phase transitions. So what that means is I mean, it's sort of intuitive, I guess, for physicists, but um, you could have the situation where your likelihood uh, looks like this, and then it's sort of a, almost a plateau and it continues like this, right? And so if you, some of the methods, some of the Monte Carlo methods or other methods will then have a bit of an issue when they are here because they don't know where to go because it's sort of almost flat. So they, they might have a difficult time exploring this parameter space or they may, might make very big jumps here, might make very big steps and they might not see this uh, sort of small region of the parameter space. I mean, if you imagine this in higher dimensions, this, this part would be quite small. And uh, one uh, benefit of nested sampling here is that because it's shrinking the volume always by, a same, by the same factor, it doesn't really care how quickly the likelihood is increasing. It doesn't really look at that at all. It only cares about the order of this likelihood in the progression. And so it can, it can cross these phase transitions very nicely. And such phase transitions are quite common if you have problems where, so if you have data sets, for example, where you have uh, a very strong, broad overall effect. And on top of that, you have a subtle additional signal. So think about, for example, you have one sinusoid that you're fitting, and on top of that, you have a higher frequency signal that is very weak. In that case, you, your, your algorithm would first characterize this broad uh, behavior, and that would give you this um, initial increase in likelihood, and then you're not improving much anymore until you discover the small region of the parameter space where you can fit in this additional second component. So this does happen in practice. And um, yeah, different algorithms deal with this differently. Uh, as you might've already noticed, I quite like nested sampling. <laughs> um, uh, that said, I use Stan almost daily. And there are very strong points about using Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. It's, it has a very good foundation. It's, uh, it's very efficient. You have the speed. 
It also scales to high dimensions. So if you add parameters and complexity to your model, it, it goes uh, with you. And it has these nice diagnostics where you can identify when your algorithm, so your algorithm knows by itself when it's going wrong. Mess sampling is a bit of a younger field. And so you saw that these diagnostics are still being developed. Um, and this is kind of something I like about it. There's still opportunity to make contributions to it. Um, and yeah, I, I also already mentioned the other aspects like multimodal problems. This is something that nested sampling is quite good at. But now let's think about using HMC and, and these uh, physical metaphors uh, within nested sampling. So uh, can, you, can you do something a bit more complicated than the HMCs that I mentioned before? And I will not go into detail here, but if you're interested in this, then I would recommend to you this paper, uh, Nested Sampling with Demons. And what they do is they phrased nested sampling algorithm in the same language that we heard yesterday, in this uh, language of statistical mechanics. And they make a very nice and interesting addition to this problem. So um, so we had before that we have our likelihood contour, and we have within that already some posterior samples. And we want to find a new point. And so we, we've been playing with MCMC to walk around in there and, and, um, and reject when we hit this likelihood boundary. But the problem here, or one maybe not so nice thing is that you don't know if you're close to the boundary or not. You're not really using any information that how fast the likelihood is decreasing to guide how you would have to walk. So it's, just geometric, whether you're inside or whether you're outside. And this paper suggests, well, can we make this border a bit fuzzy? Um, is, is there a way to do this? And similar to what you saw yesterday of introducing auxiliary variables, they also introduce an auxiliary variable. They add one more variable to the parameter space. And what do they do with that? they allow the algorithm to stuff some of the likelihood in there to hide some of this energy. And that washes out this boundary contour. And what you can show similar to what we saw yesterday is when you uh, marginalize over this daemon variable where you store away some of this energy, when you marginalize this away, you again end up with uh, basically what nested sampling would do normally, you end up with the same uh, posterior as if you hadn't introduced this additional parameter. But what this really then allows you is to have guided walks that sort of look like, like this. If I can draw that. So you could, uh, this is not a very good illustration, but you could sort of slowly cross that nominal boundary and be guided to be, uh, to have an indicator that, oh, maybe you shouldn't go in this direction. Maybe uh, try to deviate back into where your region of parameter space is supposed to be. And now you can use uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo uh, much more nicely within nested sampling. And you can decorrelate your walk. You, you don't have this diffusion behavior where you just walk around randomly in some small region here. You actually can cross large parts and you're not always making the same step size, always forgetting uh, about the likelihood because you can't use it. You just test whether it's inside. You actually can cross this parameter space. And it's an interesting uh, research avenue whether you can combine this idea with nuts, for example, the no U-turn sampler 
and uh, look at this extended nested sampling with these Hamiltonian uh, H, uh, Monte Carlo um, with the steaman idea. So uh, if you're interested in HMC, this is, this is definitely an interesting um, area to go in. Okay. So I would now like to stop talking about nested sampling. I think I've talked more than enough about nested sampling. And I would like to briefly, very briefly, talk about important sampling. What are some advanced methods there? And then I want to talk about MCMC methods that don't use gradients and are quite popular and how they work and what their limitations are. But before that, again, I will give you opportunity to ask questions if you have any left on uh, nested sampling, anything about nested sampling really. Okay, let me move on then to important sampling. <clears throat> I actually don't know exactly what's the most advanced methods here, but I just want to illustrate one of them um, that I found interesting. And it's actually a paper from people at the campus. And it's this one. And they are wondering how we can we construct one of these proposal distributions for important sampling. How can we do this efficiently? And uh, they are using Markov chain Monte Carlo to start this process. So how do they do that? Okay. So <clears throat> let me just scroll to the illustration. So they have a particle physics problem. Um, which they are having difficulties with um, and they want to find algorithms that can deal with this and for this they define a toy problem that sort of behaves very similar to their real problem but is faster to evaluate easier to work with uh, and they test their algorithms on this so they use this uh, toy problem that we've already saw that we've already seen and it's basically these two rings. So you have multimodality, two modes here, and they have weird curvature. So you can imagine if you take half of this, you have your banana, <clears throat> and here you also have some weird curvature. So how can you uh, make an algorithm that, that explores this, uh, this um, posterior efficiently and covers both modes? And they had problems, I guess, with Markov chain Monte Carlo. I guess they cannot compute gradients either. So they're thinking about how they can go about it. And so this is their approach. Um, they first, so here you would see, <clears throat> they first run Markov chain Monte Carlo, I think with a Gaussian proposal like we did. And here you see the posterior for one of these Markov chains. You see it, it, it walked around here, but it's not efficient enough. It didn't cover the, the space here very well. And so it's, it's, it's biased, but it found this, this mode. And another chain found this mode, um, but didn't jump to this mode. And so what they do is they run a bunch of chains and some land in the left one and some land in the right one. So here in this particular instance, five landed here and three landed here, and you get their posterior distribution. Then what they do is <clears throat> each chain, they cut into chunks 
just like we did before. Let's say you have your eight chains and you cut them in, let's say, five chunks each. And then from each chunk, you can have, you can compute the covariance, which you can associate with an ellipsoid. And so imagine that these are the ellipsoids for each chunk. <clears throat> and now what they do is they apply an algorithm which improves these clusters or improves this ellipsoid, which optimizes these. Um, and here you see the optimization result. And how is this process done? How can you optimize some proposal distribution? Let's say each of them is a Gaussian. How can you optimize some existing proposal distribution to uh, fit better, to be describe better your target, your target function? And what they use here is expectation maximization algorithm. Actually, there are two algorithms that are very closely related. They just, essentially, they just optimize for different things. The expectation maximization algorithm is a bit more rooted in maximum likelihood methods. And the, uh, and there is variational base is a different uh, algorithm and that one optimizes what we've already heard about it optimizes the information gain the callback leibler divergence but let me just stick with um, expectation maximization for the moment so if you have and just use this illustration i will not go through the algorithm but if you already have a guess for for example, here, Gaussian um, components. Here you have two Gaussian components and you try to describe these samples. You can use the density of these Gaussian pro uh, proposal and the likelihoods of these samples to optimize, to make a new guess for what your parameters of these Gaussians are supposed to be. And importantly, you can make that guess analytically in each iteration, you uh, guess a slightly better um, proposal. And you see here, it's after a few iterations, after 20 iterations or something, um, the proposal is optimized. And this uh, kind of approach, this expectation maximization is what they use here. And finally, they end up with a very nice decomposition of their posterior where you have these uh, components, they are optimal for this target function. And now they use this Gaussians to do important sampling and they finally get a bunch of posterior samples and they're happy. So this is a rather elaborate scheme that these people came up with. I don't know if this will work for other problems. I don't know uh, how robust this is, um, but you could, you can see that you can combine a variety of schemes here um, and, and get some algorithm that is sort of tuned for your particular problem. Um, I also want to show here that they make a comparison uh, on the evidence integral. And their method here is in blue. They get quite small uncertainties because they use a lot of samples and their proposal is great. And they compare to multi-nest here, which is this multiple ellipsoid um, nested sampling technique. And what they notice is here in these panels that this uh, multi-nest um, gives a biased result. In this case, they know the true result. It's the vertical dashed line because they, their problem, their toy problem is analytic. And they find that this multi-nest algorithm gives them a biased results. Here you see the multiple runs and it's always overestimating the true evidence. And why is that? Well, it's because in this particular problem, let's see if I can scroll to that illustration again. Here's uh, one illustration. <clears throat> 
So it could happen if you make this ellipsoid decomp decomposition. So here we have one ellipsoid in blue dotted, and here we the second ellipsoid. That actually the true contour, which is shown here in gray, is not in entirely included in this ellipsoid. And so you're missing out some part of this uh, sampling space that you're supposed to sample. You cut off this tail here and you're biasing your rejection sampling. And so essentially what's happening is that you would move up in likelihood too fast, faster than you should, and your evidence integral will be biased. And that's what they show here, that for their particular problem, and this is, um, has been tested now in a couple of uh, papers, that in this particular problem, uh, Multinest gives uh, a biased result at least with the standard parameters. Okay. Let me just make sure I know my notes. Okay. So if there are no questions, uh -huh, something's in the chat. So Jonathan asks, you mentioned that uh, I think nested sampling uh, is the question about was a rather young concept. Uh, by young, I meant it was proposed in 2004. Uh, how much acceptance has nested sampling found in, for example, the astrophysical community yet? Is it still rather ever overshadowed by, for example, MCMC? So um, MCMC and nested sampling, uh, I think MCMC is still being used more, but the usage of nested sampling has been um very impressive so i think i recently took out uh, picked out the statistics of some popular uh, packages and so if you look at multi nest for example and look at their citations and then we look at I don't know, some other algorithm that I will talk about in a moment. And where's their paper? This is their paper. Okay, so you see MC, for example, has 5,000 citations, so that's a lot. And Multinest has 1,600 citations. That's also not bad. I would say, um, but I would say that's about the ratio. I mean, those are not the only packages for either MCMC or nested sampling, um, but that gives you a feeling for, for how popular things are. Okay. More questions? Ah, uh, yes, uh, so for advanced uh, important sampling, I can also measure mention that uh, there is from the same paper, there's a very nice library, which allows you to put these components together if you want to try out important sampling and these optimization methods, so optimizing these proposals with variational Bayes and, uh, and doing this iteratively, so for example, getting more samples and optimizing your proposal and so forth. This is a very nice library that allows you to, to, to do this. And, on, and it gives a very nice guide 
of how each of those components work. And uh, there's a nice tutorial, which basically does what they do in the paper and describes in code how you put all of this together um, to iteratively optimize your proposal. And I've taken this and implemented it also in another library, uh, which is this one. Um, which what it does is <clears throat> it first uses a, a minimizer. In this case, it's a minoid, which you might know from root. So it finds the maximum likelihood in your parameter space. It finds sort of the peak. It uses another algorithm to define how what's the local covariance matrix, what's the, the so with finite differences, it finds what is the structure at this point. And then it creates proposal distributions around there, um, tries important sampling, um, and, um, and then iteratively improves with variational base this proposal. So sometimes this can work. And in this case, I'm also showing here um, the Rosenbrock function. Um, in black, you see the posterior samples. So even though this function is not Gaussian, it did a pretty good job at drawing posterior samples from this. So that is something you can use, although it has efficiency limitations that we already talked about. So now let's talk about MCMC and advanced MCMC, but without gradients. <clears throat> Okay, so I want to talk about Goodman and Weary, which is a different proposal for Markov chain Monte Carlo. And they had a nice paper in, when was this? 2010. And they proposed um, a method to update their. Um, to, to further their Markov chain Monte Carlo to find an, a new point. And the crucial ingredient here is that instead of having a single walker, which makes a transition and makes a transition, you now work with a bunch of walkers. So similar to nested sampling, you have uh, life points. Here you have, they are called walkers because they walk around and you have, uh, you, you're working with a number of these objects. And then you're thinking about how can we use this population to update um, one or several of them. So let's think about that for a bit. And let's just assume we have created already initially some population of walkers. And then we think about how can we update them. They also use Rosenbrock, nice. But the sketch I want to get to, where is it? I thought there was a nice sketch here somewhere. Did I skip it? Oh yeah, this one. <clears throat> okay, so let's say you already have 10 walkers. And now what they do is they make a pair. So they say um, you pick and you want to update this one, this one, and you pick randomly from all the other ones, another one that will help you. And you draw a line from the first one through the second one. And you can do this in arbitrarily many dimensions. You can always define a line between two points. And now we're gonna use that direction to draw a new point. And um, to make this work, there's a special probability distribution that they use. And um, essentially, I think it falls off like this if you drew it to the side. So high, um, I'm not entirely sure if I got that right. But the point is that 
um, towards very distant values, the probability would be low. And um, there is also a factor here, uh, I think it's called R, which controls how far away you would propose. But in any case, on this line, they find a new point, and that's then uh, your proposal. And you have again apply the metropolis rule. You check the probability rate ratio of there to where you started, and you found a new point um, for this Walker's Markov chain. And you do this with all of them. And so you've updated your ensemble to a new state of this ensemble. And now what the people from MC realized is that you can actually make these pairs by saying, okay, I will draw some of them red and I will draw other ones blue. I will randomly assign them to two groups of equal size. I don't know if I'm managing here. Okay. And I will make pairs, one from the red group and one from the blue group. And first of all, I will up, update all the red ones. Uh, I will update the red ones. And the blue ones stay where they are. And then I will update the blue ones using the new red positions. So the red ones moved. So this Y, oops, that's the wrong color. This uh, Y point, if it's accepted, would be the new red point for that particular one. And I use that for the blue one to for another blue one, randomly chosen, uh, to make a jump. And now I've updated both the blue ones and the red ones. But the important thing is that you can parallelize this. So when we update all the red ones, um, <clears throat> each red point is independent of all the other red points. And the blue ones are fixed anyways. So we can farm out the likelihood evaluations of all the red points, update all of them. Well, now we have six processes working in parallel, or in general, the half of the ensemble. And then we repeat this with the other group, with the blue ones. And now you've found a very nice way to parallelize Markov chain Monte Carlo. You update always half of your ensemble, randomly selected, and uh, you proceed that way. So that's that's the idea between behind MC, and that's great. Oh, now my points move, and that's great, and that is described in this paper. So they they. Um, take advantage of this parallelization. Oh, and I should have said something quite important, which is <clears throat> because you're using these pairs of points, um, you're taking the directions from the ensemble um, at a later stage in your Markov chain Monte Carlo, these points are already distributed according to your proposal, uh, according to your target function. So for example, if your target is highly correlated like this, your points will already lie within there somewhere. So the lines you will draw will be quite good at capturing this local uh, correlation. You will not draw very many lines like this and not very many lines like this, but you will draw mostly lines sort of in this direction. And that's where the idea of a fine invariant comes from. If you rescale this problem, um, this population of walkers would run as efficiently. So it's insensitive 
to any affine trans transformation because of this line proposal. <clears throat> So that's cool. And um, in fact, it's so cool that people thought, hey, we can do this in nested sampling because we already have a population of points that are distributed within the contours. So why don't we also use this, these lines here? And that brings me to a very interesting paper. Which is not related to nested sampling, don't worry. It is, where is it? It is right here, okay. So it is properties of the affine invariant, properties of the affine invariant ensemble sampler in high dimensions. So I will not go into a lot of detail here, but I want to just convey you basically the conclusion of this paper, uh, how this, uh, this algorithm, this MC or um, more generally this um, Goodman and Weire affine invariant ensemble sampler, how it behaves in high dimensions. And they say in high dimensions, the stretch move, this is what we discussed before, has unusual and undesirable properties. And they use a, just a simple Gaussian toy problem with known mean and covariance to inspect this. And what they're basically finding is because you, you're always using these lines and um, a, between pairs of points, what they're finding is that if you run this algorithm for many iterations as um, in, for example, a 50 dimensional problem, what they're finding is that these points tend to collapse to a subspace. So you're not able to propose in all possible directions anymore. All your points are not linearly independent anymore in some sense. Um, and so your proposal becomes biased. And they also say that in trace plots, you cannot see this. So there, there is an issue that even the diagnostic doesn't tell you about it, but um, they're able to see that um, in the posterior, there is a bias. <clears throat> even though the diagnostics say it's okay, um, this proposal has some issues in high dimensions. And then they have some theoretical analysis of this proposal to analyze why this, this happens and under what circumstances. So if you're interested in this, uh, have a look at this paper, which looks at the limitations of this MC algorithm or Goodman and Weary proposal. And uh, yeah, I will not go into detail, but there's another ensemble method, um, which is, which also has a friendly package um, and that's ensemble slice sampling. That's another MCMC algorithm that doesn't use gradients. And their idea is to use size, slice sampling. So you start out here somewhere, you put a slice through your parameter space so you pick, for example, a parameter, you pick some point that's surely outside, uh, far away, and then and you pick uh, a height. So you have your likelihood or your posterior density at this point. You pick so randomly, uniformly a height, and then that defines this sort of slice. And you walk around on this between the a point that's certainly outside and the one that's certainly outside on the other side, you try to find a new point on this slice. And that would be the green one here. And you repeat this procedure. But the nice thing about an ensemble is that you can actually use the directions again. Now, does this proposal have the same properties as the other one? I think nobody knows. Um, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. <clears throat> 
But what they show is at least um, it's, it seems to be much more efficient than uh, either the Metropolis Hastings uh, Gaussian proposal or simply doing slice sampling on one walker if you use the ensemble to propose directions. Um, you take advantage of this knowledge of the local structure and it sort of works. Here's the funnel problem. And yeah, so this is another algorithm that seems to be become or package that seems to become popular and that's called SUS. So I think I went through a lot of material and I think I'm done with what I wanted to talk about. And what I really just wanted to convey to you is <clears throat> that it's an interesting research area. Um, there are many open questions. Um, there are very different approaches of how to go about these inference algorithms. And you can, as you saw, you can also mix and match. You can combine approaches from various uh, techniques. And um, there are relatively mature uh, software packages available if you just want to apply them. Um, I hope I gave you also a sense of what diagnostics are available for these various tools so that you can try out a bunch of tools and see how they behave for your problem. And maybe you can study um, how they compare, how efficient they are, do they give reliable results, so forth. <clears throat> And uh, for the homework exercises, especially the big homework exercise is about making this comparison, uh, trying out two, um, at least two methods, ideally one of these uh, advanced packages and see how they, uh, how well they work and, and how they behave on your problem of interest. Okay, um, I see that. Maybe there is something in the chat. I read that I already answered. Yes, so I think we've reached uh, the end of what I wanted to cover in this uh, blog course. I hope it was useful for you. And I will just uh, stop here and take any remaining questions. So, uh, Johannes, uh, uh, thanks a lot. Um, I just a very short question. What package do you use mostly? Yes, so I use uh, Stan quite a bit. And uh, other than that, I mean, this is uh, very biased, of course, but I will tell you anyways. Um, I mostly use Alternist. And this is a package that uh, I developed and it uses this algorithm that I also showed you in the visualization. It uses these, um, these uh, ellipsoids around each life points. It's very robust because it does this cross validation. Uh, it's a little, it's maybe not this, uh, the, the quickest algorithm but it's very robust and it handles um, multimodal problems and so you can, in my experience, you can um, put this also in data analysis pipelines and it will not fall apart immediately. And so for example, for our work uh, in Erosita, uh, that's an X-ray satellite that's recently analyzed or detected tens of thousands of active galactic nuclei. And we want to characterize each of those sources for its X-ray spectrum. So we analyze tens of thousands of data sets <clears throat> with um, eight models, I think. And so you really need an algorithm that you don't have to babysit, that uh, works uniformly and you can apply to a large number of data sets. And in, in this case, we had a relatively low dimensional problem and we applied this uh, because that's the one that, that works and terminates at a reasonable point. And so this is the one I, I use very often. <clears throat>
but it's also one that I wrote. So, of course, I'm biased. It's understandable. Thanks. Okay, um, well, thanks a lot. It's been a pleasure to have you in this course. It was uh, very active. I was very happy with the breakout rooms, uh, how you all participated. Um, thanks a lot for your interest. I hope it was useful for you, for your research. In the next week, we will learn about, so we have some method which does posterior samples. Um, in particular, we will look at STAM and we will be, just applying this method <clears throat> and see how we can actually um, encode our research problem, make it more complicated, uh, diagnose what's going wrong, uh, make predictions, uh, change our assumptions, and all of this, how we go from, from a science question to a, a conclusion, how we really implement a Bayesian workflow with one of those tools. <clears throat> so we will continue on Monday at 10 with Francesca leading the block next week. And I will close here. You are welcome to stay online if you have any more questions, but uh, that's it for this week. Thank you.